Welcome to today's programme. My guest is Pat Allerton, also known as the Portable Priest. Pat, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. It really is great. We've known each other quite a while, haven't we? Yeah, I reckon so. About 20 years or so? I think so. Coming up? When you were a little teeny bopper. <laughs> well, I was sort of mid-twenties at that point. But yes. <laughs> you have been known as, as the Portobello Priest and then the Portable Priest. Yes. How did you get those titles? So I'm a vicar in the Church of England uh, based in Notting Hill and right down the back of um, our church building runs the Portobello Road and our office is on the Portobello Road. So I wanted to come up with an Instagram account or social media account that would allow for my parishioners to sort of tune in or eavesdrop as to what the church was up to. And so I was toying with sort of, um, idea. I had sort of dog collar diaries or the other idea was like the Portobello Priest and you know, it took some sounding. So I went with the Portobello Priest just to put stuff out public facing, to say, look, this is what's happening on Sunday, this is what's coming up. So that was my account initially, but then um, it slightly got hijacked. Yes, into another brand. Oh, it's almost like a brand, isn't it? The Portable <laughs> Priest. Well, I, well, and we'll talk is. about how that happened as well. But you went to a school called Eton, mm. which is a very prestigious school mm. uh, for some of our uh, listeners and viewers who may not be familiar with Eton, how would you describe the school? It's a huge institution. I think it's it was founded in, gosh, I'm going to come unstuck here, about 1550 or, yeah, around that. I mean, it had its 550th anniversary some years ago. So it's, it's an amazing place. It, it has about 1,200, 1,250 students, uh, all of them board. So you're in boarding houses with 50 other boys, 10 in each year with two adults in the, in the house, like your housemaster and what's called the dame who's taking care of you. So quite a, a risky sort of um, environment to you know, put your children in through their teens, I'd say. But it, no, it's, a, it's an amazing place. I mean, it's a broken place, but it's a, a special place. It's got a special place in my heart. I mean, I came to faith when I was at school, so the journey I was on during those years uh, is very, important and precious to me and I made a lot of lifelong friends so and it's the school where Prince William and Prince Harry were it, yeah, attending exactly. so we and are, many I, other royals yeah, from all over the world I think historically yes exactly I think historically you suddenly realize that you know the person you're you know rubbing shoulders with or um, fouling on the football pitch is um, fourth in line to the throne that sort yes. of thing Freddie Windsor was in the house next door to me and I had no idea who he was but um, no, it was a privilege to go there. Prince William overlapped. He was a few years below me. And um, every time I saw him walking on the street, I'd see him. He seemed to catch his foot on the paving stones. He seemed to obviously drag his feet. Be like, oh, there he goes again, sort of tripping up. But um, no, it's, uh, it was, yeah. I mean, at the time, you just think it's school. But of looking course. back, it's, it's a fairly unique place. Now, growing up, Pat, did you have faith? No, no faith at all. Um, I mean... <laughs> my dad always takes issue when I say, oh, I'm not from a Christian family, there's no faith in my home at all. Uh, and he's like, well, I had faith. Uh, and so he does have a lovely, warm faith. And I think that's warmed up uh, since I've come to faith. But at the time, we didn't go to church. Um, it meant nothing to us. There was no conversation about it. The only faith I came across was at school. You know, I was boarding at boarding school from the age of seven and then through Eton. And I was in chapel most days. I sang in the choir, so I was in their extra hours rehearsing and singing. Um, but it meant nothing. And it just seemed irrelevant to me, even though we're in these beautiful buildings, college chapel. Um, it but just didn't that, hit home. But isn't that interesting, Pat, that y you can go to chapel every day, which was part of the school curriculum. It was compulsory. Yeah. And, and yet not engage with the reality of it. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it just has brought home to me the importance of, you know, the Holy Spirit to make us alive to these things and give us ears to hear. And before he starts stirring us, 
we are, like Ezekiel says, you know, we've got hearts of stone. We need a heart of flesh. And I think, uh, you know, you spend most of your time in those places hoping for some distraction, you know. And most of my mates would, you know, you try and do a fart, you know, to distract people during prayers, to get people laughing. You know, you certainly wouldn't be sort of listening intently to most of the sermons, which were pretty boring, I have to say. So when did your faith come alive and how did you encounter Jesus? So in my last year at school, from about the age of 17, 18, I I just started having big questions about life. Like, what are we doing here? Where do we come from? You know, what happens when we die? Is there a God? Can I find hope and meaning? And my best friend, Dave, was a Christian. Uh, He'd come to faith a couple of years before. So he started taking me to Christian Union at school, which I didn't know existed really. Um, And I'd hear talks there. He took me to church in London, to HDB, um, a couple of times. And as I went to these places, I'd hear these talks from the Bible. And it was done in a way that suddenly it made sense, or it was scratching where I was itching. And uh, I went on that journey. And then eventually he said, do you want to come on this camp in the Easter holidays um, before our A-levels? So I was like, well, I've only got revision to get on with, so why not? So I went on this camp with about 100 other teenagers, and I saw right from the off there, I just saw this joy and this light in their eyes, in their their faces um, that I knew I didn't have. And I kind of knew, well, this must be to do with this Jesus guy. And on the third day there, I heard a talk on the evidence for the resurrection. And it was during that talk that God really just, it was like the veil was lifted as I realized, my goodness, I think this might actually be true. It's the only logical explanation for these Christians being excited, for the existence of the church, for the explosion of church growth. And that night I went back to my room, long story short, I prayed a prayer to the ceiling, God, I think you're real, but I don't know you yet. I don't know you like these guys know you. I want to. Would you come into my life? And I just sort of waited this nervous, terrifying wait as I felt, if nothing happens now, I'm going to give up my search because I don't know how to offer more of myself to any God that is out there. But as I waited, it was a bit like that exercise, you know, where you, in teams, you you fall backwards with with your arms held out and someone catches you. And it's about trust. And I felt spiritually I was falling backwards. And I was like, God, here I am. I'm willing to, you can have the drink, you can have the drugs. I'm willing to turn away from everything else. And in that moment, thank goodness, God caught me and the Holy Spirit filled me. I was lying in my bed, it was midnight, and I sort of arched up on my, the back of my shoulder blades and my heels in this sort of ecstasy of, of just feeling love and hope and joy and peace, just filling me that I'd never known. And I was like, yes, this, this is what I've been looking for. And in that moment, I think I, I knew or felt this is what everyone's looking for, whether they know it or not. And I, in that moment as well, I think my calling was sort of I received my calling, which Absolutely. the overflow just wanted to tell people. So that was, you'd say that that night you were born again to it, quote Jesus. Yeah, exactly. I went next door and, you know, 12.30, knocked on my friend Dave's door. He was asleep and woke up. I was like, Dave, Dave. He's like, ah, yeah, yeah, what's going on? Dad? I was like, I think I've just become a Christian. And he was like, that's amazing. That's amazing. Should we talk about it in the morning? Yes. You know, um, but, um, but you yeah. couldn't wait to tell I someone. I was bubbling. And it felt like the light had gone on. And the next day, this guy who we were in dorm groups, like house groups doing mini group times. And the next he's like, what has happened to you, Pat? It, he's like, you're like a light bulb today. You know, because before, you know, I was bottled a lot of stuff up and I was angry about one or two things. I was hurting about one or two things. You know, people didn't at school, you didn't, didn't like to get on the wrong side of me because I had a temper and I could flare up. But now I was just just totally smiles all around mm. and I had that radiance that I saw in the others. So it was like you, the light was switched off but now it was switched on exactly. and it was yeah. the light of Christ. Exactly, yeah. Um, now growing up you either wanted to be a fighter pilot or be a surgeon. Yes, yeah. But you ended up becoming a reverend. <laughs> so go on, tell us about that journey. Yeah, well, I mean, you're always trying to work out what you want to do at school. And that was uh, at a time when I didn't have faith. So, you know, being a minister was not on the you know, radar. But as soon as I came to faith, had that experience, I just wanted to, I didn't even know what it was, but I just wanted to be a preacher. I just wanted to tell people. And I would tell one person, I'd happily tell a million people, whatever the Lord wanted to do. 
and uh, I didn't know any preachers. But I hadn't heard of you by that point, John. Um, but the only one I knew of was Billy Graham. So I was kind of yeah. like, yeah, Lord, I want to be a Billy Graham. You know, because it just over. I definitely didn't want to be a vicar. Uh, you know, because and for many years after that, I'd walk past churches in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> you know, in the south, and I'd get this sort of cold, claustrophobic, slightly nauseous feeling, thinking like, who's vicar here? You know, just thinking, goodness, Lord, I, I, I couldn't do this. I couldn't do this. And so then, when I felt the tug and the pull towards that, I was like, oh, were you joking? You know, but as many people said, you know, it's the best boat to fish from. Yes. And as an evangelist, you know, I want to do fishing. And, you know, you do get a pulpit, as a friend once told me. So um, it was a, a winding road. I, I, I could have gone there from 18. I could have just uh, not gone to university and went to Edinburgh, but I could have just started then. But I went to uni and then worked at HDB for a year um, and realized I want to do this. But the advice was very much, look, if you can do something else first, do that, get that out of your system. And I recognised the wisdom in that, so I went off and thought about being a lawyer, a barrister, did the training, and then was like, goodness, no, I'm not called to do this. Um, and But then I, I did want to have a job, so I got a job in the city for 18 months doing financial PR, which I was officially useless at, um, although yeah. I made some good mates and hopefully it was a good influence in the office. Um, but had some fun and saw what working life is like, you know, the pressures people face, you know. But after that, I just felt the Lord saying, OK, look, it's time to crack on with what I've actually called Absolutely. you to do. Absolutely. So. And you were a, a minister in a couple of churches, but you ended up in Notting Hill. And uh, I remember you telling me that years back you echoed a prayer to God while you were in Notting Hill. Yes, it was a, I think it was a lovely spring or early summer's evening. I found myself driving through the streets of Notting Hill. And if you know it or you've seen the film, well worth watching the it, film. Is again. it like that? It's very like that. They do a good job in the film. But, you know, all the coloured cottages and colourful houses. I mean, it can look pretty beautiful. And I just found myself driving around and just thinking, I wonder what's going on in this place, you know. And, and I found myself sort of mouthing um, gently sort of saying a prayer to the Lord, Lord, is there any ministry that you need doing around here? <laughs> Basically like, I mean, I, I could be available. I mean, it's not as if, uh, you know, it, there wouldn't be many people saying, I also could be available in yes. Notting Hill. I mean, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so but I said this throwaway prayer 10 years before. And how many years, 10 years before? Yeah, well, at, at least, I mean, yeah, about yes. 10 years before. And then you ended up... And then suddenly the job came up and I applied and amazingly sort of um, got it. And was got like, it. wow. Those throwaway prayers, who, who ever knew how valuable they can be? Absolutely. Now, during the whole lockdown period, uh, you were prompted to do something unique. Tell us what happened. Yeah, I mean, it's, it seems ages ago now, doesn't it? But as we remember, you know, when lockdown happens and we realise, gosh, we're going to be inside, you know, for the coming week. Two weeks. Who, no one knew how long it was going to last. But I remember shutting the church doors behind me um, and just thinking, that's the last time we're going to gather uh, physically together for some time. And I remember just the thought dropping into my head, what if I headed to the streets of the parish and took a speaker system, a loudspeaker, and played a hymn, a favourite hymn, uh, and led a prayer, said the Lord's Prayer. Why don't I do that, you know, to reach the people of the parish, to comfort them, encourage them, um, distract them, you know, lift their spirits. So I thought, oh yeah, that's quite a good idea. You know, and I've done things on the streets before. I've led prayer meetings on Parliament Square, you know, with hundreds of people. I've had the Bible read out over Parliament Square, over the Houses of Parliament simultaneously by 80 people in an hour. I believe in making a splash for the Lord, you know, and showing the world that the church is alive and just doing prophetic signs like that. So this idea was right up my sort of street, as they say. Um, at that point, I didn't think, oh, Lord, is that you? But I just thought, yeah, let's do that. You know, I can do it as my exercise. So I grabbed a, a yeah, speaker. And, and what I like about that, Pat, is, is that, of course, we want to be guided by the Lord, but also we want to do things for the Lord. 
yeah. you know, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. Yeah. And um, that's what I like about you. You're willing to get out of the boat. Yeah, you kind of like take a risk every now and then. Um, and it was a risk because I felt as we were setting up, so my housemate at the time, Chris, um, he came and got the gear together. He's quite techy from church. So we got what we needed, then we headed to the Portobello Road. And as we plugged in that first time, and on the way there, driving down, there's a video of it, um, I picked out Amazing Grace, this version by Judy Collins, an old 70s rocker, which was like incredibly beautiful. But it was like the Lord guided us to that song, because I was like, okay, let's use this one. I knew it needed to be a hymn everyone loved, and that even non-Christians knew. Yeah, familiarity. Exactly, like comfort. Um, so as we plugged in, I didn't know what response it would get, but it's like, hey guys. Up. So where was your first one? On the Portobello Road. The Portobello no. priest hit the Portobello Road and plugged in and with a 1K sound system, basically over a silent, no traffic, remember, no cars. This sound, I later realised, because I did it in Hyde Park and from Kensington Palace, it went the other side of the Serpentine, which is like a mile and a half away. I mean, this was covering the whole area, but I gently introduced like, myself saying, hi guys, I hope you don't mind me this, you know, invading your silent um, fr Friday evening, whatever it was. I'm Pat, I'm the local vicar of this parish. I just wanted to lift spirits. You know, if, if you're open to it, come to your windows, your doors, feel free to sing along, I'm gonna play Amazing Grace, and then lead us in the Lord's Prayer, and a moment of silence for NHS, people who are sick, you know, that sort of stuff. And so went with it, and just saw dozens of faces in sort of the high rise, you know, blocks, Windows open, people looking out. People looking out, like, what's going on here? Curiosity. Doorways. Yeah. And so there was this sort of silence during the, the hymn. And then we kept a moment of silence, lifting people we know who were grieving or struggling, and then said the Lord's Prayer, and then said, you know, well, then didn't say anything, came into land on the Lord's Prayer. And there's this moment, and I'm like, am I about to be heckled or booed off court or have things thrown at me? But no, there was this little ripple of applause that sort of grew. And it was like, oh, woo, woo. And it was kind of like, ooh, you don't normally get that, no. you know, so as a street a preacher. Sense, a sense of appreciation. I think so. Just uh, from, you know, from whatever perspective they were coming from, like, you know, even if, okay, I don't believe this nonsense, but this is a lovely thing to do for the community. So it was warmly received. And that's where it was born and sort of realizing, I think the Lord's hand might be on this and there might be some favor on doing something that wouldn't normally be well received <laughs> on the Fordabello Road. Um, so that was day one. And for the next 10 weeks, I went out, you know, several times, you know, a week, doing a few locations, different day, um, different days. You started doing it outside of hospitals? Yeah, a friend said, you must go to the, and I was like, yes, we must. So went to Charing Cross Hospital, Chelsea and Westminster, went to about seven different hospitals. And staff and patients would look out of the window. Yeah, I mean, there you don't see many because they're vast buildings and sometimes the windows aren't see-through, you know, so you couldn't see. Or they see. can't open but them. But you would hear, I'd hear testimonies from inside about, from nurses, from, from people who were in there who heard it. You know, one nurse said, um, I'm not a Christian, but thank you so much for coming to Charing Cross. At the time you played that, I was in there um, helping a patient who went on to lose their fight with COVID-19 and as we heard this, I was bawling crying, but you'll never know the peace that that song brought to me and her at that difficult time. And that was a story, but getting stories like that again and again from people behind closed doors, you know, closed windows, just encouraged me that, you know, God's at work and yes. he can use this. As long as people can hear it, you know, who knows what God can do. So. So how many times did you do that during lockdown? So I think it was 64 times I but, worked but, out. But each time you went out to several locations? Yeah, I mean, sometimes one, you know, yeah. if the weather was good, sometimes four. I think I did five in one day. Went to a couple of, went to a prison. Um, where'd I go? Uh, Wormwood Scrubs, where there's a hospital and a prison. So I did get a bit of heckling from a prisoner. He was shouting, but I don't know if he normally shouts. Maybe it felt like he might do that quite often. And what any other encouraging stories that come to mind? Um, one woman I love that uh, I did it near my parish in Notting Hill, and um, 
this lady texted me later or Instagram me and said, look, um, at the time my husband was on a conference call when the noise started up and it was quite loud. Um, and she, her husband said, can you go and find out what that noise is and shut it down or turn it down? Um, so she said, I was on my way to ask if you could stop or turn it down. And, but when I got to the doorstep, you know, I found myself with tears in my eyes and warmth in my heart. Thank you so much for, for coming and doing what you did, basically. You know, just, and for me, it's like, that's the Holy Spirit, isn't it? You know, doing the stuff that we wish we could control, but we can't. But he, he's in control, he's sovereign, and he can do what he wants to do. I mean, it didn't always go well. There's one funny story of early on, I went over to Vauxhall, and I was doing it there, plugged into, I had to be plugged, I got a petrol generator eventually to be independent and socially distanced. But originally I needed an extension cable, which so I needed a, a person of peace in the community to plug yeah, into to their plug power. In. And my friend said, come to us, you know, we're on the first floor flat. They lowered an extension cable to me. I plugged mine in. So there was this wire coming from the first floor flat to my car where the speaker was on the top of the car. And it was blaring out and I was introing and this woman came out from the flat next door and was like, do you have any idea how disruptive you're being? Yes. And in my head I was sort of like, well, yes, actually I do. <laughs> it's quite obvious. But I was like, look, I'm so sorry. It's just going to be five minutes, one hymn and a prayer and then I'll be gone. And she went back inside. And then halfway through Amazing Grace, after verse two, she reappeared. And I was like, oh, I'm going to have to intercept her and just say, look, it's just two more verses. But before I could get to her, she'd seen the extension cable coming out the window and the join, and she just went straight up to it and just unplugged it. So, you know, it was like, through many day, and that was it. And that was the end of that. And I tried to pick up the mic to say, sorry folks, so let's, and obviously that didn't work. So I was like, okay, let's just say the Lord's Prayer and we'll close. And yes. so it didn't always get well received, but I went and had a chat with her and said, look, I'm sorry, afterwards, what's nice is the next day or two days later, her daughter, who somehow knew about it and was following me on Instagram, messaged me to say, look, I'm so sorry, that woman was actually my mum. And she's actually a lovely lady and does a lot for the community. And I'm like, I'm sh I said, I'm sure she does, you know. I please send her my best. But she's like, you know, I'm so sorry, but um, thanks for going around there. But I know. Um, yeah. But the national uh, media um, found what you were doing very intriguing, Pat, and uh, interviewed you many, many times. And uh, is that where the phrase the portable priest came out of. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I think the first thing I did, or one of the first things, Sky News were onto it and asking, what's going on? I mean, they didn't have much to write about, did there was very little news. So look, well, there's some weird vicar doing something in Notting Hill, go and cover that. So did interviews with various people, and then I did an interview with, and my media understanding, you know, ramped up a lot, as you can imagine, but something called the Associated Press, which are people who do stories and then other news outlets and media companies yeah, pick, them up. pick them up you know thousands just take the story and either print as is or re reword it but this journalist interviewed me and then her story came out and suddenly i was no longer the portobello priest i was the portable priest yes and i contacted her and was like oh, look you got this wrong it's the portobello priest yes you know she's like oh i i just thought it might be better i thought it was like more captured what you're doing that you're the portable priest now and i was kind of like whether I liked it or not, it had already gone out and was suddenly all over like gazettes and bulletins all over the place. So it's like, well, you know, the horse has bolted, whether I like it or not. But actually, I sort of saw the Lord's hand in it because it was more what I'd moved from Portobello to going all over London and south of London. Yes. And, and it actually gave it you captured. a bigger platform to also talk about why you did it and what the content of the message was. Yeah. That there is good news. Exactly. So she'd, uh, you know, unexpectedly rebranded me, but in a way that was helpful. And I think help people to in a, in a moment know, ah, okay, that's what that guy's about, that weird vicar. So um, yeah, and it's something I still run with. I still, uh, you know, it's still my name on Instagram. And I'm kind of like, should I just change it? It's a bit, you know, yesterday. No, keep it. <laughs> keep it. Because in many ways, that's what Jesus was. He was the portable priest. Yeah. And you're just walking in his footsteps, really. Yeah, exactly. Doing the same. Yeah. Your book, Pat, A Pocket Full of Hope. 
Yes. Loved it, Pat, very much. You, it says on the cover, an A to Z of answers to life's big questions. Um, okay, tell us about this. Yeah, well, this is amazingly like secular publishers got in touch during the pandemic um, to say, would you be interested in a book? Only one of them stayed the course about Penguin got in touch first, four of them were in touch. When I said they all wanted a book on hope and I was like, yeah, of course, I'll talk a lot about God and Jesus. And it was like, no, you know, no likey, no lighty, that dating program. It's like, like, boo, 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 boo. You know, the lights went off, three lights went off and only one stayed the course saying, yeah, we're up for that. And yeah, this... and, and that's fascinating, isn't it? Because uh, they wanted you to write a book on hope, yeah. and which you agreed to, but you know that it's in Jesus that we discover hope, yeah. but they didn't like your answer. Well, exactly. I mean, you know, and I said it sort of like, I've got, I've got nothing to say about hope. And we've got, as Christians, nothing to say about hope if we don't talk about Jesus, right? And so I'm delighted that Yellow Kite, you know, went with it. And what I wanted to target with this book is essentially, I mean, this is a book that I hope will encourage Christians and it's a, a you know, thought each day it's yeah people of faith and people of no faith it's really written for people of no faith so if you're wondering for your friends your brother sister mum dad you know colleague who's not really interested at all but is not totally anti it's a book that hopefully will get them thinking and it stirs the idea of each chapter is like look we all try and solve this issue a bit around anxiety or grief or forgiveness or calling or joy or purpose or meaning you know this is how we look to find it or solve it in the world but it doesn't quite work this is the difference faith makes this is what God and Jesus can bring to your life and it just gently gently introduces that idea and sows that thought hopefully in a way that will I see it as a sort of pre-alpha course book to give your friend to get them thinking to soften them so I, I just think we can't have enough, and you're the master of them, John, like producing those books to give away yes, to non-Christian friends. absolutely. And that's a book to give away to your non-Christian friend, really. Pat, it's been great having you uh, on the programme. Great to hear a little of your own journey of faith. Uh, keep being that portable priest <laughs> and Thank keep you, telling others about Jesus. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Pat. Thanks so much for having me. I really hope that you've uh, enjoyed that conversation with Pat Allerton and I hope it's inspired you and encouraged you in your own journey of faith. Thank you so much for joining us. Please join us again.